friends, my name is Danny, and this is Ale and Agony. Welcome on in. Would you like to get cosy and talk about some murder? <laughs> Before we get into uh, today's case, um, I guess a couple of things actually. Firstly, um, my boyfriend Sam is downstairs. He's on a completely different floor to me, um, but he's very excitedly playing Northgard. So hopefully you can't hear him, but if you can, super sorry about that. Um, and then secondly, I wanted to share um, a new podcast app with you guys. Um, it's called Good Pods. And I just want to start off by saying I am not sponsored in the slightest. I just think that their platform is really good. Um, it's really easy for writing reviews and giving feedback on particular episodes of podcasts. So it allows you to interact with the hosts and other listeners as well in a really unique way compared to the other podcast apps I've found. So I just wanted to give you a heads up if you like podcasts and you want to get a bit more sort of social with it, then I definitely recommend Good Pods. But let's start with the ale of this week's episode. I don't have one. <laughs> I have a black Russian though, nom. Um, so let's get cosy because I will be telling you about a case requested by one of our patrons, and it's fucking rough. It's the case of Albert Fish. So let's crack it open. I can't crack this open. Cheers. Hamilton Howard Fish, later to be known as Albert, was born on May 19th, 1870. So we're going way back. Hamilton was born to his father, Randall, and mother, Ellen. And Randall was certainly raising some eyebrows, as he was 43 years older than Ellen. So, I mean, God knows how old she was when she married the man, because back then, like, arranged marriages between family were still quite common. So I'm just hoping it was all above brow. Although, at this point, I'm pretty sure marital rape was still legal, so I don't like thinking of that. Anyway, little Hamilton had three siblings, Walter, Annie, and Edwin. And although not too much about his day-to-day -day childhood was known, there was unfortunately a string of mental illness in the family that were prominent. Hamilton's uncle was diagnosed with mania, which is a psychological condition that causes a person to experience unreasonable euphoria very intense moods, hyperactivity, and delusions. One of Hamilton's brothers was also confined in a mental institution. His sister Annie was diagnosed with having a mental affliction, which is a very vague term, basically meaning a condition of great distress, pain, or suffering. So, could be anything. Hamilton's mother also suffered from both oral and visual hallucinations, so a lot of his immediate family were all suffering from some form of mental illness, except for one brother and his questionable father. When his father Randall passed away from a heart attack on October 16th in 1875, when Hamilton was only five years old, Ellen could not afford to keep him and was finding herself more and more mentally unstable. And so she placed little Hamilton into the John's Home for Boys Orphanage. It isn't stated anywhere what happened to his siblings, but it sounds like he went to the orphanage on his own, and then that is where he remained until he was nine years old. Throughout his childhood, Hamilton was teased about his name and was often nicknamed Ham and Eggs by the little bastard children, and so he adopted a new name for himself, one that was taken from a distant family member. Albert. So when five-year-old Albert arrived at the orphanage, it was clear that the boys there had all been beaten, and he soon discovered that there was very little that you could do to avoid the beatings from the nuns. And this is where things take their very first sharp left turn. Albert found out that he liked the beatings. Like, he really liked them. So much so, that the other boys would tease him for the erections that he would get during the punishment. Now, a nun may see a tiny child erection 
and think that it must be related to the devil. And you just keep on whacking at the kid and hoping it will all go away. But they were actually just fueling the fire in this case. Because Albert loved the beatings so much that he would start to seek them out. Going forward to 1880, Ellen has managed to secure a government job. Things have turned around, they're going in the right direction. So she collects nine-year-old Albert and finally takes him home. And she has no idea what awful fascinations have been awakened in her son. So the fair assumption here is that Ellen and Randall had never beaten Albert. So what would have happened if these intense beatings never occurred? What would have been the catalyst to Albert's fascination with self-inflicted pain? It's been a few years since leaving the orphanage, and Albert was now 12 years old. He'd been introduced to sexual feelings from a very young age following the beatings. And Albert started a relationship with a telegraph boy who introduced him to the practices of urolagnia, which is drinking urine, and coprophagia, which is eating feces. Like, what are the chances? What kid is into this? So on top of self-harm and beatings, Albert now starts to drink, piss and eat shit. And at this age, Albert also started to go to the public bathhouses at the weekend and he would spy on young boys getting undressed. So we have an intense mix of stuff going on and he's only 12. In 1890, Albert finally hits his 20s and he went to New York to make some money as a sex worker. And this is where he claims the raping of young boys began. Not much is known of this particular time in his life, but Albert would later state that he had children in every state. And it's widely believed that he's referring to sexual assault rather than murder. Not that that makes it any easier to hear. Years later, in 1898, when he's 28 years old, Mother Ellen arranges for Albert to marry 19-year-old Anna Mary Hoffman. Imagine being Anna. Like, you've got no idea what this guy's really into. I don't know if she ever did find out. But, like, surely you'd have a bit of an inkling. It's not like he's only got one deviant practice that he has to hide from her. Like, he has a whole fucking script. Up until this point... All of Albert's known relationships and victims had all been male. So I don't know whether he was gay or not, but he did go on to have six children with Anna. So they named one Albert, they named one Anna, and they also had Gertrude, Eugene, John and Henry. The year that they got married in 1898, Albert was working as a house painter and he continues to molest children. He stated at this point that his preference was young boys under six years old. So like, toddlers. Shockingly, Albert was not faithful during his marriage to Anna and a male lover once took him to a trip to a waxwork museum. I imagined something like, you know, Madame Tussauds, but there was a bisection of a penis, and Madame Tussaud would never. This bisection of a penis became Albert's new obsession, along with sexual mutilation. Now, I decided that googling a bisection of a penis was a smart move at 6am whilst writing up this script. And I have found some things, friends. I have seen some things. I have seen some stuff. Apparently, you can split a penis in the same fashion that you would split your tongue. And you'd have two happy little halves that just move independently of each other, often called a double header. I was expecting to see a penis sort of cut down the middle where you could then sort of see the, the inner workings and the tubes and all the things all labelled up. So that was uh, that was quite a shock. <laughs> In 
In 1903, Albert was arrested for embezzlement and grand larceny, which I looked up because I wasn't quite sure what that was, and that is theft of personal property above a certain value. I don't know much about the details of this. Perhaps it was a theft from a client whilst he was working as a sex worker. He was sentenced for this crime and sent to Sing Sing, which is a maximum security prison in New York City. And whilst there, continued having sex with all the men. In 1910, after his release, 40-year-old Albert met a 19-year-old boy called Thomas Kedden, who Albert described as mentally disabled. It's unknown if this relationship was consensual due to Thomas's mental state, but he and Albert had a sadomasochistic relationship. And after only 10 days, Albert took Thomas to an old farmhouse where he tortured Thomas for two weeks. The torture finally came to an end when Albert, probably thinking of that double header, cut off Thomas's penis. He then doused the open wound in peroxide, and I will give you a well-deserved moment to clench. He then put petroleum jelly on the open wound, covered it with a handkerchief, gave Thomas $10, gave him a kiss goodbye and walked out the door. And my co-worker <laughs> told me that if you get a paper cut, you should put lip balm on it to help it heal quicker. And I immediately thought of Albert Fish blobbing some petroleum jelly on this poor guy's severed dick. And I, I don't think she saw the fear flash in my eyes. Albert kept half of the penis that he cut off as a souvenir and admitted that he wanted to kill Thomas and take his body home with him in small pieces. But he decided it was too hot and the body would start to smell very badly, very quickly. Albert later said, quote, took first train I could get back home. Never heard of what became of him or tried to find out, end quote. And the fate of Thomas Kedden was never known, but many speculate that he died alone in that farmhouse. In January of 1917, Albert's wife Anna, after six kids, had finally had enough of his shit. I assume that she probably had an inkling about the affairs, maybe got quite fed up with him just disappearing for weeks at a time. So she ran off with the handyman called John Straub, who was actually lodging with the family at the time. Quite the scandal. Anna left all of her kids behind. She just left them there, and now Albert was left alone as a single parent, echoing his mother's past. And just like his mother, Albert started having auditory hallucinations, and once wrapped himself up in carpet, saying that he was following the instructions given to him, from John the Apostle. As his mental health continued to decline, Albert dabbled in his favourite pastime and started to self-harm and inflict immense pain on himself. He would insert long metal needles into his groin and abdomen, but he wouldn't pull them out. He wouldn't sort of like insert them and then pull them back out again. He'd leave them there. And I'll include a, a photo on Instagram of his pelvic x-ray where you can see all of the needles lodged into his body. Albert would repeatedly beat himself with a homemade nail-studded paddle. And he would even douse wool in lighter fluid, put it in his anus and set it on fire. And yes, that does sound comical, but can we just take a moment to understand how fucking painful that would be? And it's not even like the initial thing that you do. It's like the aftermath of that. Like you've got to use the bathroom and you've set yourself on fire. And it's just the fact that he would willingly do that to himself because he liked it. 
No reports show Albert harming his children in any physical way, but he did used to get them to sit on his back while he was naked and on all fours. He would then play a game. He'd ask them to put up their fingers, and if he didn't guess the right number, they would be allowed to smack him with the homemade nail-studded paddle. And that is just some nightmare shit for your daddy to put you through. Albert's next extreme, because everything so far just isn't cutting it anymore, was his fascination with cannibalism. And he would start to regularly eat raw animal meat for dinner. And he wouldn't force this on his children, but he'd always offer it to them and plate it up. And can we take a moment for Anna? for leaving her children in this house and running off with the handyman. Fuck you, Anna. Nearly ten years after Thomas Kedden was tortured in the farmhouse, Albert stabbed another mentally disabled boy whilst he was in Washington, which he was never caught for. Albert admitted to choosing either the mentally disabled or the African-American children to victimise, because he said that they would be less missed and unlikely to be investigated. And as awful as that statement is, it proves to be entirely accurate because he was never investigated for any of these crimes. Albert's first slip-up was in July of 1924, so he's now 54 years old and he comes across an eight-year-old girl called Beatrice Keel, who was playing on her family's farm. Albert was confident, walked straight up to her and asked her for some help. He asked if she would be so kind as to help him pick some rhubarb and he would happily give her some money. Beatrice was about to go with him when her mother came running out, chased Albert off. When her mother came running over and chased Albert off, Albert had his sights fixed on Beatrice, so he spent the night sleeping in their barn, but was again discovered, this time by Beatrice's father, who also chased Albert off of the property. Good job, Keel family, because that guy fucked off for good that time. He didn't come back. Four years later, on May 25th in 1928, now 58 years old, Albert saw a classified ad in the paper, and it said, Young man, 18, wishes position in country. Edward Budd, 406 West 15th Street. So, three days later, Albert rocks up to this address and introduces himself as Frank Howard. And Frank is a very successful farmer. From Farmingdale. And that should have set alarm bells ring in. He proceeds to tell the family that he has a position available on his farm in Farmingdale and due to his age he could really use some help so he came to see young Edward after seeing the ad in the paper. When Albert met Edward he wasn't sure if he was going to be a good fit because Edward was quite big for his 18 years so he left for a few days to mull it over. He decided in the end that his plan was to get Edward somewhere safe, tie him up, mutilate him, and leave him to bleed to death. That sounds familiar. But when Albert came back to pick up Edward, he was introduced to his ten-year-old sister, Grace. And this changed everything for Albert. He did a 180 on the spot and decided that Grace was to be his intended victim. So he told Mr. and Mrs. Budd that he'd come back later once Edward was packed. But in the meantime, he was late. He was meant to be going to his niece's birthday party. And he asked if little Grace would like to accompany him. And I guess due to the tiny atom amount of familiarity that this man had brought from his two visits, and the fact that he was hiring their son, Mr. and Mrs. Budd allowed Albert to take Grace away and they never saw her again. 
No one knew what happened to Grace. All they knew was that this frail old farmer from Farmingdale had taken her away. But a couple of years later, in September of 1930, police arrested 66-year-old Charles Edward Hope after his ex-wife had convinced police that he was somehow involved. And poor old Charles served over a hundred days in prison for this crime that he did not commit, and he was later released because the only evidence that the police had was some hearsay from some bitter old bitch who just made some shit up to get one over on her ex-husband. Not cool, lady. Six years after Grace's abduction, the family received an anonymous letter in November of 1934. And I'm going to read this letter to you. And this is your warning to skip ahead if you don't want to hear the details of what happened to Grace. So this was written by Albert. And the letter read. My dear Mrs Budd. In 1894, a friend of mine shipped as a deckhand on the steamer Tacoma. Captain John Davis. They sailed from San Francisco to Hong Kong, China. On arriving there, he and two others went ashore and got drunk. When they returned, the boat was gone. At that time, there was a famine in China. Meat of any kind was from one to three dollars a pound. So great was the suffering among the very poor that all children under twelve were sold to butchers to be cut up and sold for food in order to keep others from starving. A boy or girl under 14 was not safe in the street. You could go in any shop and ask for steak, chops or stew meat. Part of the naked body of a boy or girl would be brought out and just what you wanted cut from it. A boy or girl's behind, which is the sweetest part of the body, and sold as veal cutlet, brought the highest price. John stayed there so long, he acquired a taste for human flesh. On his return to New York, he stole two boys, one seven and one eleven, took them to his home, stripped them naked and tied them in a closet, and then burned everything they had on. Several times every day and night, he spanked them, tortured them, to make their meat good and tender. First he killed the 11-year-old boy, because he had the fattest ass, and of course the most meat on it. Every part of his body was cooked and eaten, except the head, bones and guts. He was roasted in the oven. All of his ass. Boiled, broiled, fried, stewed. The little boy was next went the same way. At that time, I was living at 409 E 100 Street, rear, right side. He told me so often how good human flesh was, I made up my mind to taste it. On Sunday, June the 3rd, 1928, I called on you at 406 West 15th Street, bought you pot cheese, strawberries. We had lunch. Grace sat in my lap and kissed me. I made up my mind to eat her on the pretense of taking her to a party. You said yes, she could go. I took her to an empty house in Westchester I had already picked out. When we got there, I told her to remain outside. She picked wildflowers. I went upstairs and stripped all of my clothes off. I knew if I did not, I would get her blood on them. When all was ready, I went to the window and called her. Then I hid in a closet until she was in the room. When she saw me naked, she began to cry and tried to run downstairs. I grabbed her and she said she would tell her mama. First, I stripped her naked. How did she kick, bite and scratch? I choked her to death, then cut her into small pieces so I could take my meat to my rooms, cook and eat it. How sweet and tender her little ass was roasted in the oven. It took me nine days to eat her entire body. I did not fuck her, though. I could have if I wished. 
she died a virgin. Excellent. Should we talk about that? I'd rather move on. Let's do that. Uh, but first, I do have to tell you that Mrs. Bud was illiterate and it was her son who had to read that letter to her. So... This letter would spark the downfall of Albert because the letter had a hexagonal emblem on the paper with NYPBCA printed on it. And that stood for New York Private Chauffeurs Benevolent Association. So the police went to the office of this association to find out who could have written this letter. And they soon discovered that the janitor that worked there had once taken some stationery home with him but he said that he left it behind when he moved. He told the police that he used to live at 200 East 52nd Street, and so they had a new lead to follow. Chief Investigator William King spoke with the landlady at the property, and she said that she was holding some money for Albert Fish, who was renting that particular room. He hadn't been around for a few days, but she was sure that he'd be back to collect the cash and C.I. King camped outside of Albert's room and waited for his return. Albert came back just as the landlady had suspected. He was obtained by C.I. King and agreed to go with him to the police headquarters. But then this motherfucker pulls out a razor blade and starts swinging at C.I. King. But he's old, he's quickly disarmed, and he's taken in. Albert is finally captured, and once he has sat down, Surprisingly, he tells the police everything. He tells them that Edward was his initial intended target until he met Grace. But he reaffirmed multiple times that he had not raped Grace. I mean, I personally believe that if Grace was a little boy, then that would not be the case. But he assured police that raping Grace had never crossed his mind. Like, okay, good, so... So glad that you just murdered her then. Like, isn't it really odd how murderers have, like, their own, like, moral code? Like, he'll literally eat shit and children. But he wants you to know that he'd never rape a girl, though. Because that is too far. And although he never sexually assaulted Grace, he did confide to his attorney that as he was strangling her, he did have two involuntary ejaculations. And his attorney must have told someone because that wound up in the trial and so his motivation for Grace's murder was spun from cannibalism to sexual gratification. So during the trial, Albert just kept on singing like a bird and he told the story of two other children that he murdered before Grace. In July of 1924, four years before Grace, nine-year-old Francis MacDonald was reported missing by his parents. Francis was outside playing with his friends, who later described Francis walking away with a man with a grey moustache. Francis was later found hanging from a tree. He had been raped and strangled with his own suspenders. Francis also had many lacerations across his legs and abdomen, and nearly all of the flesh was missing from his left hamstring. But Albert denied having anything to do with the missing flesh. Like, again, that is a step too far. But he did then go on and say that his intention was to castrate Francis, but Albert fled the area when he heard someone nearby. Francis's mother recalls seeing Albert earlier that day, she said, quote, He came shuffling down the street, mumbling to himself and making queer motions with his hands. I saw his thick grey hair and his drooping grey moustache. Everything about him seemed faded and grey. End quote. And so his alias of the grey man was born. Francis's murder remained unsolved up until Albert's face was plastered all over the newspapers for Grace's murder. Several eyewitnesses came forward to confirm that this was the man that they saw in the area, including the father of the young girl that Albert tried to bribe into picking rhubarb. Isn't that a full circle moment? 
and like the terror in those parents when they realised just how close their child was to becoming another victim of this man. At first, Albert denied the charges, but after Grace's trial was over, he admitted to raping and killing nine-year-old Francis McDonnell. The last murder that Albert admitted to goes as follows. In February of 1927, which is a year before Grace's murder, three-year-old Billy Beaton was playing on the landing of his apartment with his 12-year-old brother, along with his friend, four-year-old Billy Gaffney. The older brother went to the apartment to go and get something, but when he came back, both boys were gone. His young three-year-old brother, Billy Beaton, was later found on the roof of the apartments. And when officers asked him what happened to his friend Billy Gaffney, he told them that the boogeyman took him. The police obviously didn't believe the three-year-old, and Billy Gaffney's body was never discovered. We only discovered what happened to four-year-old Billy when Albert wrote a letter to his attorney following Grace's trial. And I'm going to read it to you now, and again, this is very graphic. Please skip it if you don't want to hear it. The letter read as follows. I brought him to the Riker Avenue dumps. There is a house that stands alone, not far from where I took him. I took the G-boy there, stripped him naked and tied his hands and feet and gagged him with a piece of dirty rag I picked out of the dump. Then I burned his clothes, threw his shoes in the dump. Then I walked back and took a trolley to 59th Street at 2am and walked home from there. The next day, about 2pm, I took tools, a good heavy cat of nine tails, homemade, short handle, cut one of my belts in half, slit these half in six strips about eight inches long. I whipped his bear behind till the blood ran from the legs. I cut off his ears, nose, slit his mouth from ear to ear, gouged out his eyes. He was dead then. I stuck the knife in his belly and held my mouth to his body and drank his blood. I picked up four old potato sacks and gathered a pile of stones. Then I cut him up. I had a grip with me. I put his nose, ears and a few slices of his belly in the grip. Then I cut him through the middle of his body, just below his belly button then through his legs, about two inches below his behind. I put this in my grip with a lot of paper. I cut off the head, feet, arms, hands, and the legs below the knees. This I put in sacks, weighed with stones, tied the ends and threw them into the pools of slimy water that you will see along the road going to North Beach. Water is three to four foot deep. They sank at once. I came home with my meat, I had the front of his body I liked best, his monkey and peewees, and a nice little fat behind to roast in the oven and eat. I made a stew out of his ears, nose, pieces of his face and belly. I put onion, carrots, turnips, celery, salt and pepper. It was good. Then I split the cheeks of his behind open, cut off his monkey and peewees and washed them first. I put strips of bacon on each cheek of his behind and put it in the oven. Then I picked four onions, and when meat had roasted for about a quarter of an hour, I poured about a pint of water over it for gravy and put in the onions. At frequent intervals, I basted his behind with a wooden spoon, so the meat would be nice and juicy. In about two hours, it was nice and brown, cooked through. I never ate any roast turkey that tasted half as good as his sweet, fat little behind did. I ate every bit of meat in about four days. His little monkey was as sweet as a nut, but his peewees I could not chew. Threw them in the toilet. <sighs> I know, I know. Um, Gaffney's mother Elizabeth, so Billy Gaffney's mother Elizabeth, visited Albert in the Sing Sing prison. Accompanied by Detective King, who was the man that arrested Albert and two other men, she wanted to ask him more details about her son's death, but Albert refused to speak to her and he began to weep. 
and asked that he be left alone. During Albert's trial, many people came forward to either confirm or deny whether he was insane, as at the time you couldn't give someone the death penalty if they were deemed mentally insane. It's rumoured that some of the people on the jury did think that he was insane, but voted the other way anyway, and unsurprisingly, Albert was found guilty of his crimes, he was sane, and he was sentenced to death. Albert sat on the electric chair on January 16th, 1936, and he was 66 years old. Before the switch was flipped, he's reported as saying, I don't even know why I'm here. Like, really? Like, you bragged about having children in every state and nicknamed your weapons your implements of hell. I think it's quite obvious. He was pronounced dead three minutes later, Other reports speculate that it took two jolts to kill Albert because the needles in his pelvis short-circuited the system, but that was actually never confirmed. And at a meeting with reporters after the execution, Fisher's lawyer, James Dempsey, revealed that he was in possession of his client's final statement. And when asked to reveal the document's contents, Dempsey refused, stating, I will never show it to anyone. It was the most filthy string of obscenities that I have ever read. And that, my friends, is the case of Albert Fish, aka the Grey Man, also known as the Werewolf of Wisteria, the Brooklyn Vampire, the Moon Maniac, and the Boogeyman. So, fuck me, right? It's, um, I think it's the the handwritten letters really that sort of solidify just how fucked this guy was because it's it's one thing to i don't know sort of hear what people's you know ideas and theories are behind someone but to actually read their own words it's just disgusting isn't it and i do think that he probably was insane based on the amount of mental illness that went through his family I do think that he's incredibly mentally unstable and just had so many things that just continued to spark more and more obscene fascination after fascination with him. And he's definitely someone that should have been locked away in a mental institution a long, long, long time ago. But yeah, I I think... It's definitely more, he wasn't moulded into this person. I think that he was born with these traits, but let me know what you guys think. I'd be really interested. That was a horrible case. Uh, Thank you so much for requesting it. (laughs) Uh. But let's take it back to the beginning. How was my drink? Well, it was lovely uh, because uh, my boyfriend Sam made it for me and he knows I like a strong measure. So, um, the way that we make a black Russian is we have a, um, a coffee liqueur and we have a vanilla liqueur and then we have it with Coke. And I don't know if that's the traditional way of having it. I know a lot of people have it with like, um, coffee vodka as well. I'm sure you could whack some vodka in it if you wanted to. Maybe, maybe a cheeky bit of whiskey or something. I love whiskey. I'm a whiskey whore. So I'd definitely enjoy that. Um, but yeah, it's lovely. It's like, it's a little bit sweet quite strong got the coke in there it's a little bit fizzy like it's it's a good drink i very much enjoy it um in the episode show notes um i will link all the things that i found to be honest there was a few things that i tried to get into but i just didn't really like so there is a film um called the gray man that came out in 2007 and i'll link it in case you'd like to watch it um, it's it's available on YouTube. I didn't really rate it. I just felt that it was a bit like it's dramatized, but it also doesn't obviously go into any of the detail about the case because it's horrendous. So I didn't find that particularly useful. Um, there's also a book that I'll link as well, um, which is um, Albert Fish in his own words, um, which was interesting, but horrible. So yeah, that was great. You can find updates about um, new episodes over on Twitter and Instagram. Um, And I'm going to post the photos of this case over on the Instagram page. So you can find that over at Ale and Agony. Um, If you would like to support the show and you have some spare cash and you want to throw it at me, then you can find me on Patreon 
at patreon.com slash ale and agony. And Patreon is where you'll get access to some cheeky bonus content every week. I'm uploading a little something something every Monday. And if you can't support the show with that dollar dollar bill, no worries, you can support me in lots of ways for free. You can leave a review on Apple Podcasts or the new Good Pods app that I said about at the beginning of the show. You can share an episode with a friend or you can mention it across social media. Just tag the show. I'd really appreciate it. And I would, of course, be super grateful for any feedback. And if you have any requests or stories to share, then you can contact me on aleandagony at gmail.com. And thank you so much for spending this time with me. Well done on getting through to the end, because fuck me. I hope to catch you on the next episode. Please come back. It won't be this bad, I promise. (laughs) Uh, Goodbye, my friends. (laughs) 